Hi, everybody. Um, I'm very pleased to see everyone here today. I have to apologize for my voice. I have shot um, the really bad cold for about the eighth time this winter. So I hope my voice will hold out. And if you do have problems hearing, please uh, just let me know. Um, can I ask, first of all, to start off with, maybe you can indicate with a happy face, how many people already use Novelist? Okay, so I see one happy face. Okay, so um, it looks like maybe we have some people here today who don't use Novelist yet. Um, so that's great. This is one of my absolutely favorite databases. So um, I use it all the time with my students and I use it all the time myself personally. Um, I'm going to be talking about Novelist Plus, the K-8 version, and the Novelist Plus which is the version for all ages, which has the adult content as well. Um, so the theme for this is squeezing the juice out of EBSCO, and in this case, Novelist K8 Plus and uh, Novelist Plus. And I have to say that um, before I started putting this together, I thought that um, I knew pretty much everything there was to know about Novelist or at least I knew quite a bit, but I've since discovered that there's really a lot more juice to squeeze out of, even though it looks very simple and easy to use on the surface, and it is simple and easy to use. There's also a lot that you can do with it that I wasn't fully aware of. Um, I'll just mention something here because I see um, we had, I, I used Google presentations to put this together, and I'm just noticing the first of what I know will be some of the little glitches that didn't come through on our transfer of the file. So I hope it doesn't affect anybody's reading of it. Um, things just got a little bit knocked out of place. Um, I should also mention, feel free to ask any questions or to make any comments that you want. I know Arlene's keeping an eye on that in case I don't notice it. So I've been using Novelist for many years, and uh, this person whose image you should see now, whose name is hidden, that's one of the Google Docs or Google Presentation glitches, is actually Duncan Smith. And one of the reasons I love Novelist, I've always loved Novelist, is it was actually something that was dreamed up by a librarian, a public librarian. Duncan Smith had many years as um, a public librarian and a reader's advisory specialist. Um, before he came to the conclusion, it was a frustration for him, and I put the quote here, that Reader's Advisory Services were only as good as the individual librarian's memory and ability to read a wide range of genres. So he was thinking in terms of technology and how technology could help with Reader's Advisory, and his conclusion was, well, what if there could be a database? So he partnered with a couple of people, a programmer and people who were technology experts, and they came up with their first version of Novelist, finally. It took a few years, but they came up with something. And Novelist, uh, when it began in 1994, that was when they sold their first DOS version of it, 20,000 titles and 1,200 reviews. It wasn't acquired by EBSCO until 1999, as you can see, so they had a few years to work on it. And then it really switched direction. It switched direction twice in the time that I've been using. It, and once was in the 2000 time period when they started to create data. So they started, in addition to collecting um, information about books and putting a record up for each book in their database, they also started creating book lists, creating um, content that would, uh, would just help in readers' advisory in libraries, um, help librarians and school librarians, although they weren't really gearing it towards school librarians at that point. Um, in 2002, they introduced Novelist K-8, and I can remember how excited I was about that because I've been working in middle schools for quite a number of years as a teacher librarian, and so it was wonderful to have that, that content that was specifically geared to students who were anywhere from the, well, they call it the 0 to 8 age group, and then the 9 to 12, and then the teens. Um, so they came up with that then, and then in 2008, uh, Novelist K-8 Plus, which was another big leap forward, because the plus means that they added in the nonfiction. 
So they always had the fiction in it. It was always a fiction focus, but then they added in the nonfiction. And they had the two versions at that point. They had the novelist plus um, for the all age groups, including adult books. And they had they had also the uh, the novelist K to eight plus. And then in 2010, they got a new look and kind of a new mission. So they had been talking about empowering librarians and engaging readers, and the idea was also became connecting communities. So they they really um, had made quite a big change in direction from the three people that they started with. There were close to 40 people working for novelists at that point. Um, the whole purpose of it was to answer the question, you know, what do I read next for students, for teachers, for you as a teach librarian, um, especially for people who were waiting for the next, for the, their place on a hold list, um, or for somebody who has a favorite author, wanted to find other ones the same next book in the series or a book you love and want more like it. So they really made a big focus on read alikes, as they call them. And they um, they decided to um, to really expand it at that point. So here's the new look that they came up with. And it's the one that if you've looked at novels, oh, sorry, the numbers first. So novels K to 8 plus. Um, the 82,000 fiction, 42,000 nonfiction. I would say that for Novelist K-8+, their special focus is the curriculum, um, the things that teachers and parents might want to use for students. And for Novelist Plus, it's the same information in there, but they've kind of shifted the focus a little bit. And what they've chosen to highlight is more of the independent reading, the reading um, groups, the, the lit circles kinds of things. So kind of that idea of what you do as an independent adult reader out in the world as opposed to um, to the more school focus of the other one. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So this was what the new look was like. And they included some things that were, um, were quite different. Um, their feeling is that the search in novelists is really what drives everything. So you, when you're in there, you're always on a search for something. You're either looking for that title, that author, that book in the series, the reading list, the you know discussion guide for the lit circle or the book club. So it's the search. So they made sure that the search was in a prominent place at the top of the page. And when you go in, um, do I have a cursor here? Let's see if I have a. I'm not sure if this is working for me. Anyways, I'll just guide you with what I say. The, um, so the, the search box was put in the top, and you always have um, the choice of searching by author, title, or series. And what they called all is a keyword search, but they used to call it a describe a plot search, and it still works that way. So when you have the student come to you who says, well, you know, in the book, there there's a character who does this and goes there and this happens. Or I like books with these kinds of elements. That's where you can definitely add that in. Um, they also added in uh, a very consistent theme, which is the same in both Novelist K-8 and Plus and Novelist Plus. They have on one side um, the bar of the recommended reads list. And because we're in Plus, um, which I think is a is actually a really lucky thing because it expands the options so hugely. Um, there's a little tab that you can click for um, fiction and nonfiction. We actually almost lost novelists, I should say. I don't know if anybody is aware of this, but URAC are the ones that organize um, our subscription for us, that negotiate for the subscription. And there was a, a time period several years ago when I think I just gotten excited about the plus features. And all of a sudden, we learned that Novelist was going to be out of the package. We were not having the package at all. And I think that um, that the thing that is so unusual about it is just it's our only database that is, is intended to support reading. So a number of people, me included, were really upset that it looked like we were going to be losing it. So 
we actually were able to make a petition to Iraq to reconsider it, and so they brought it back on. So I'm always a little worried that somebody might be looking at it and deciding that maybe um, maybe we don't need this anymore because I think we really we really do need it. Um, so that was the new look for Novelist Kid 8 Plus, and it's a very similar pattern um, for Novelist Plus. Lindsay, you can try using uh, the cursor if you go to the left and get the star. Oh, okay, maybe I had the wrong thing. Um, okay. Oh, I've got it now. Thank you very much, Arlene. I was uh, I was on a different little box. And then oh. hit click down. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay. Okay, so I've got two of them. Can you see two of them? I can see one at this point. Okay. I hope it's only me that can see two. I think it's just when you click that you can see. Ah. Thank you very much. Um, so with Novelist, um, the little icon up in the left-hand corner makes it always really easy to return to the home screen. And you see a similar, uh, a similar layout here for the, uh, the format of the home page. Once again, the search box is right in the center there at the top. What they call the carousel is below. Do I have to click in order to see it? The carousel. Um, has arrows to either side so that you can actually scroll through about a uh, selection of eight high interest, popular, sometimes movie tie-in books that the novelist librarians and readers advisors assume will be books that you will have in your library due to demand, but they'll also be ones that will not be available. People will be on holds list, waiting list for them, so they have automatically included several choices below each one. And unfortunately, the thing we found out was that I couldn't actually do anything live on here with the way the technology was working. So if this was live and you clicked on any one of these books or hovered over it, let me see if I can actually go to the next screen and maybe able to show it there. Um, yes, OK, there it is. So in Novelist, anytime you hover over a book, in this area, you will get a little screen that will give you a brief description, and it will also let you look for some more information. So uh, this area um, is always changing. I think it changes perhaps weekly. Um, the search box, as I mentioned before, has the, the options for the all keyword search, the author, the title and the series there, and then it also has advanced search. Um, and <clears throat> excuse me, I'm seeing multiples again here, and uh, some other options for search. Now this one, OK, the recommended reads list. So the recommended reads list, um, this list is available for fiction and for nonfiction. And it gives you a choice at the top to decide whether you're looking for books for teens or for 9 to 12 or for their 0 to 8 age group. And if you were in Novelist, the Novelist version that you would use in a high school, which is just the Novelist Plus, um, <clears throat> excuse me, you would see teen and adult. So there's a list here, an alphabetical list of, of topics, genres, and then out of each um, one of those will come subheadings. Um, and there's actually uh, a Canadian, there's some Canadian books, a Canadian uh, heading which will um, expand out to Canadian Aboriginal and Canadian historical fiction. Um, so there's also always on the other side here on Novelist, K-8+, plus. Um, there's the the resources that are of interest to um, teachers or parents. And then there's usually some kind of feature below which highlights something that is, um, is timely for, for readers. OK, so let me just go to the next one. And if you, <coughs> excuse me, go to any one of those um, lists or you do a search, you will be able to produce a list. So this is a search on um, Andrew Clements, but any one of the, um, the recommended reads lists would have also 
um, brought up a list in this area here. You have a choice of um, a grid or um, detailed or brief, and you can produce a book list from here that will let you um, actually print it off. The brief option doesn't have the covers available, but the, uh, the other options do. So you can either print in a grid format or you can print in a, a more like a list format. You can do the same for series or for authors or for links and articles. And what happens when you do a search here for anything is that everything that's applicable to that search will come up. So in this case, it was an author search. So all the, uh, all the titles by this author, and if I could scroll down, I could show you, um, all the titles by this author will come up. And you can choose to either organize them by relevance. So they will think that this might be the one that's most uh, of interest to you that they're putting at the top or a more recent one. Or you can do one that I often will do with students um, is the one that is the date. So you have a choice of date descending and date um, ascending. And I will often do the date descending because that lets you see forthcoming books. And it's pretty interesting for students who are waiting for something um, or looking for a book of a certain type to see that they can actually uh, they can actually talk to you about getting a book that's supposed to be out in a month or so or a couple of months. Um, you can also narrow down your choice. If I had put something up here like um, mystery or something that would bring up huge numbers of results, I could go in and I could start um, I could start limiting by any one of these features along here, and it would reduce my list down. The other thing I could do is over here, Novelist does contain some um, out-of-print books in the same way that your library or any library would contain some out-of-print books. Um, so you can actually do this. You can take this slider and you can move it along so that you um, can reduce the, the time span, the date span. So when I'm working with students, I sometimes say make sure the date is not before you were born because I figure that at least that will get them uh, into a time frame where they're not looking at books that are going to be so old that they're not likely to be ones they can find. Um, here, uh, I can also I can also email. I should say that I can email these searches as well as print them. But it's nice to be able to just print off a list for students and uh, just say to them, "Here's a list that you can take away with you." Now, the other thing that will come up here for if I was to click on a book cover, let me just, oh, I'm going to go back one. If I was, oh no, I'll stay on this one here, sorry. If I was to click on a book cover, and this one's grayed out because I want to show you appeal factors, but before I do that, when I go into a detailed um, screen for an individual book, um, up on the right, there will always be um, novelists also recommends this little category here will appear on the side and it will it will contain up to nine books that novelist thinks will be of interest to a student who's looking for who's looking for that book or who has enjoyed that book so a lot of novelist reviews are done by they're actually done by people but they also have algorithms that uh, help them do um, some of their uh, they're matching. But the thing about this novelist also recommends is that um, it will produce a list. It might be it might be up to nine items as I, as I said. And for each item it will be first of all at the top will be the book that the student was interested in. And then for each one of the ones below it will actually say why novelist recommends that book. So it will talk about a similarity in plot, similarity in characters, uh, similarity in setting. There will be usually several reasons for each book why a student might like to read that. But at the same time, those, those may not actually suit that student. So in this area down below here, and I can't show you on this screen, but in this area down below here will be a whole list of boxes which can be checked or unchecked uh, in, in singly or in combination, which will also lead the student to additional titles. 
So sometimes one book will have up to maybe 20 items that describe um, what it's about and why it appeals to students. So that information will be below. And so students have many choices of where to go to find another book like this because the read-alike is such an important aspect for students. Like they, well, for all of us, when we know we like one thing, we're more inclined to want to take a chance on another thing. So um, the next screen here is, or sorry, I'll stay on the screen. This screen is the appeals factors. OK, so appeals factors was another great big change for novelists. So we're used to the idea of subject headings for books. And we're used to considering a book and what its subject headings might be. But sometimes you have that student come to you and they want a funny book, or they want a book that's written in an unusual way that they liked, or they want a gross book, or they want something that's a little bit hard to find through subject headings. So novelists had the idea that what they wanted to be looking at was not so much the what of a book, not what the subject was, but the why of why a book might appeal to a student. So they took on something that's um, very interesting, and it's actually far more complex than it might appear when you're just looking at one book. So here for this book, the appeal terms are in four categories, genre, storyline, pace, and tone. And here for this book, you look and you see that it's children's stories and realistic fiction. In terms of the storyline, it's character driven. The pace of it is fast-paced, and the tone of it is funny. So those all sound um, really uh, logical, and they make sense. But their appeals was a much bigger undertaking than that. So the idea was that the storyline determines what the book's structure is going to be like. The pace is how it unfolds. The tone is the feeling. And the writing style is the language and the level of detail. Um, I've included on the next screen some examples of these terms for teens. So action-packed, character-driven, world-building. Some of them are a little, they're not obvious at first glance. So world-building, uh, by that, novelist means something that is like Chronicles of Narnia or, um, <coughs> or The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings, something where a whole, an entire world has been built for readers. The pace appeal terms, they're usually one or the other, fast-paced or leisurely. But the tone ones are, are very creative, I think. Um, Angst-filled, atmospheric, bittersweet, bleak, creepy. Uh, that's not all. There are list after list, or, or term after term in the list. So, for example, in the tone, we also have mystical, offbeat, romantic, sassy, steamy, suspenseful, upbeat, and whimsical. And those are the ones that are for teens. And the writing style has the same sort of um, range of possibility for it. So for that one, you can have richly detailed, jargon-filled, descriptive, dialogue-rich, dialect Bridge, slang heavy, scholarly, spare, candid, compelling, gritty. So there's lots and lots of choices there. And from within the book, you can click on that link for uh, to get those appeal terms. But I think it's actually not a bad idea for yourself. And maybe if you can, if you find that students are um, interested in using those terms, to have just a reference, an easy reference somewhere where you have them printed off. They're available for the 0 to 8 is a list. Um, the same for the 9 to 12, and the same for adult, as well as the teen. And it's different for each one. There's some similarities, but there's also some differences. Like um, uh, in the 9 to 12, we get into the, the gross and the silly and the funny, laugh out loud funny, and um, the sarcastic. So we get some of the ones that might not be, um, be applicable to some either a younger or older. So those appeal terms were a huge change of direction. And what they were trying to do there was take what readers' advisory librarians have always done, which is to find whatever route into 
a book or a reader's interest in books can be um, can be pulled out in order to make that match between the student and the book or the teacher and the book or whatever the situation is. So um, since I can't actually click on books and show you, uh, I wanted you to see a few sections of what these areas look like. Uh, the book detail page, when you print, when you click on it, um, it gives you once again that, that those appeal factors. It also gives you um, an age for uh, for this uh, recommended age for it, and it gives you a persistent link here. So if you wanted to, if you wanted to have this book, if you were doing something with the Hunger Games trilogy and you wanted to have links to these within an assignment, and for example, you wanted to say, okay, we're doing dystopias, and you've all read these ones, and here are the descriptions of them. Now follow this link into into um, novelist, and you can see, for example, here the readalikes from novelist. So these readalikes would be dystopian fiction of various titles, um, the uglies, and uh, a number of other ones that fit that category. And you can see down here a little bit more of the detail about those uh, subject headings and also the appeal. Sorry, the appeal factors appear down here so that people can can switch and uh, go beyond books if they don't see what they like here. Um, you also have your pages here um, where you have, as a librarian, as a teacher librarian, it's really useful to be able to have um, to have the, the reviews from reviewing journals that appear um, right next to each book as you're considering it. Um, I, I use this when I am trying to put together lists to um, as consider, sort of consideration for purchase. Even though I can access book lists online or I can access um, some of the other sources that we have, it's just great to have one where you know for sure there will be some of the really well-known reviewing journals that will appear right here. Um, and you also get more about the author, and then you'll get lists and articles. So for this, it will appear in, uh, there's a wonderful article in here about dystopias and dystopian fiction. And it will include everything from activities that you might want to do with a class that was studying dystopian fiction to a whole range of other books that you might want to have them read in addition to whatever they read together as a group or as uh, book clubs. The series detail, the same thing. This is a great source. When students actually come to me and say a series is missing, um, some either one or more titles, um, I often will say to them, OK, go and check in Novelist and see see what, see what, how many titles are in the series, what orders are in. And let's just see what we've already got, and let's double check. And then it makes it very easy to, um, to know what it is that you still need to order. And of course, the series um, page, a series detail page, will also bring up suggestions for read-alike series, which is great, because sometimes students don't just want another title. They actually want you to suggest a series of titles, because they've loved what they've read so much that they want to have that same experience again and uh, get into another series. So <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Um, and the same thing down here, you can once again search for these terms. So it's nice, I think it's nice that the, the format is the same between the two, because if students start to use this in elementary school with their teachers or with their teacher librarian, and then they can use it more independently in middle school and maybe upper elementary. Um, and then they can go on and uh, use it in high school too. And it's just the same, the same format, it's just switching to something which now contains adult books as well. The author detail page, so once again, same format, the information, the read-alikes, the search for more, you can see more of that here now. And then the same uh, tabs across here, more about the author. Now the more about the author, another thing that's nice about that is when you go into that, it, it'll be the biographical information about the author, but it will also connect right to that author's website. So sometimes I think, you know, when we're trying to do library websites or Learning Commons 
build sites or whatever it is that we're trying to work on. A lot of the responsibility for keeping things up to date rests with us. And in a way, Novelist is doing a lot of work for us here. So they're ensuring that um, if there's an author's website, then that author's website can be linked to through here. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, please ask any questions if anyone has any. Um, there's, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, a lot of detail and more than it sometimes uh, would be obvious. Um, Canadian content is one thing that um, everybody wonders about. And so I just took a little bit from their their um, page on Canadian content. And it's actually um, it's actually a four page, three or four page document. So they are uh, this little excerpt here shows that they're tracking bestsellers in Canada. Their criteria, um, they're working with a book distributor called Library Services Centers. Um, and here is their criteria for what, what who is a Canadian author. And it, it's, uh, it's not always as simple as you think. Here it's currently lives in Canada, says he or she, says in Canadian sources, such as interviews, that the author is Canadian, although he or she lives somewhere else, eligible for Canadian awards. And uh, reputable sources indicate that the author is Canadian. But um, they also track awards. And you can go from the Novelist homepage and you can click on the award winners link um, from the resources box on that uh, right-hand side. And under awards by genre, you can actually go down and there's a Canadian link there. So you can have a result list of all the Canadian awards that Novelist is tracking. You can even look for the awards for a particular genre by um, linking from the drop-down menu, the genre drop-down menu in the narrow results. So you can find uh, any of the awards that we would be aware of that would be coming out in news releases or in our in journals about Canadian uh, awards. Or we would be able to, we should be able to find them in here. And I think they're very receptive. They actually, so here's something I love about them, they work 24 hours a day. So I actually made a request because um, I realized that something needed to be updated. And I made it just before I went to bed at night. And I woke up in the morning, and it was there, all fixed. So I think that's quite unusual, um, but they're very responsive. Um, to find a Canadian author in Hovelist, you actually go to the advanced search, which is up at the bo bottom of that search box. And you, um, you, take, uh, you, you choose the cultural identity of Canadian. And that's how you find that. There's also recommended reads lists that are for Canadian books. As I mentioned before, there's the historical fiction and the Aboriginal fiction. But there's some other ones in addition to that um, in the nonfiction. Um, also, book discussion guides for Canadian books. Chandra's Secrets is one that comes to mind. A Thief in the House of Memory by Tim Wynne Jones. Um, so they are, I think, working on uh, making sure that there is Canadian content for us, because when they first started out, it was a great source for American books, but not for Canadian. Um, in the sections in the articles and list detail page, um, so here is is where you can find um, you can find some of the um, you can find articles. So you can find lists um, for all kinds of topics within EBSCO, um, and you can print them off quite easily. I found it a great source of ideas to work with teachers on um, projects for research as well as reading, uh, because some of that work of gathering together resources so that you know that you have enough fiction or nonfiction for a title is already done for you. And you can see there's a lot of different there's additional lists here. There's lists that are um, categorized. I'm just going to go to my other screen here so I can see a little more closely because the details are quite small on that one for me. Lindsay, um, how yep. do you let students, how do you train students to use novelists? Oh. oh, OK. Um, there's, uh, yeah, uh, there's a just a 
bit of a, uh, there's a slide at the end, but I'll mention now how I do it. Um, I, what I do first of all is I create an account for the student and I try and keep my accounts really consistent for everything that the students use. So we have that student number and a password which students use to log on to the network here at school and I'm sure it's similar everywhere. But their student number goes with them everywhere so I actually have them use that as their logon as their username and then whatever their password is is their password and they just need to remember that if they change their password for the network they're going to have to change everything else they've used. Um, it works 99% of the time once in a while there's a student whose number is not accepted by the system I can't imagine why but in that case I'll just put a first name with the number. So I have them um, I have them go on and create an account and then as you'll see in a slide later on it comes with once you have an account you can actually save any results that you find you can save titles you can save lists anything that you are interested in that you come across you can put in a folder and you can do that without logging on at the end of the session when you log or when you leave novelist you just have to email it to yourself but if you want to save it from visit to visit then you do need that account. But it comes preloaded, and this was another change, because it used to just come with the ability to make folders. But it now comes with books I have already read and books I want to read. And that's great, um, because I have students who are tracking their reading in that. So they keep track of books that they want to read. And if those are books that are not in the library, they suggest those books to me and then the books that they have already read. Um, and we actually, a slide later on also shows that um, one of the things that is really important, is, I think, is that you get novelists to set up a link to your library catalog. And in my case, I've also linked to my public library catalog. So for example, students um, for a recent trip, we do walking field trips down to the public library branch that's closest to us here. Um, do them a number of times a year with classes, particularly grade sixes. And uh, just before Christmas, some students were in here getting ready for that, and they were choosing some books from my library, but they were also um, choosing books, looking in novelists for their interests, and then clicking on the link to see if it was in the public library catalog, if they couldn't find it in the school library catalog. And then they were writing down the call number and the title and the author, so they got down to the library, and the librarians were very welcoming, as always, but they said, oh, we're so sorry. You're, you're going to have a hard time because our systems are all down. And the students just, nope, we've got our list of call numbers. We're going to go and find our books. And off they went to find their books. So they're very comfortable using this. And the one folder that I asked them to add in, a custom folder, is uh, books for the library. <coughs> so if they come across things and they check, because quite often students will come and they'll say, oh, can we please get this for the library? And it turns out, if they look in the catalog, that we've actually got it, um, but it's out to somebody. Or um, so, But what they can do is, I mean, if there isn't a book, we don't have a book in the catalog. I mean, we're just working with what we have in our catalog. So the kind of additional layer that, that novelists um, creates is it broadens the possibility of books so that they're not only looking for books in the library, both libraries, but they're also they're also making book suggestions. And in some cases, I just sit a student down and says, we don't really have many books on horses, um, and we don't. I'm in a library that um, I've had to do a major renewal on, and we've also moved three times for seismic upgrades. So, or for one seismic upgrade, we moved three times. So things have been packed and unpacked. and So there's been a lot of weeding happening here. So there are areas in here where we don't have books. And if a student draws that to my attention, I'll say, OK, sit down. You and a friend come up with a list of fiction and nonfiction on horses. And uh, give me that list. Email me that list. And it has worked really well with students. They've been quite um, quite keen to be able to do that. The one thing that's the concept that you have to get across to them that is difficult at first is novelist is not like a library catalog. So if you look in you know, your school library catalog or the public library catalog, you can expect to find the book there. But novelist is more like having a best friend who is 
who knows a whole lot about books, and they have a great list of books. So once you find some things you like, then you have to go and you have to look in the library. So the key thing that I think has to be there is those links. And they will set it up. You just need to go to the feedback link in the upper right hand of this any screen in Novelist, or Novelist K-8. to And they will do it for you in no time at all. They will set up the link. And they'll be there to your library catalog, but I'd also suggest the public library. I think it's a really nice combination. Um, whoops, let me go back one here. Another thing that I think Novelist does really well and uh, is they, they do a lot of that preparation work that we don't necessarily have time to do. So right now in March this year, you know, we're not that far, we're not that far into this month, um, they're already thinking about summer reading and they're, they're um, coming up with all kinds of suggestions. So if you want to do, and they're that far ahead for other themes as well, um, they had, you know, a love your library theme and um, Christmas theme, so Halloween theme. So anything that you might want to prepare for, you might want to look in these novelist newsletters, which are available um, for you to subscribe to, so they can come to you in your email, or you can also um, you can also just go you can you know, go to the link where they have the archived material, and you can look through it that way, but. It's great to have um, to have somebody doing all that work, and then to be able to say to the students, you know, if you see something on here that's interesting, and it looks like it'd be a good pick for the library, suggest it to me. So there's things just looking at this page that you could work with if you were doing something um, with curriculum, or if you were doing something just for personal reading. Um, of course, this is an American product, so the Common Core stuff they're doing a lot with the Common Core. Um, which isn't such a, a, a focus for us, um, but they they do link into our IRPs as well as um, the American um, curriculum guides. So, um, so I think they are aware that we're here, and they are anything any suggestions that we can make. Like if I think if I emailed and said, could you do something on Canadian books in one of your newsletters? They, I think they would be open to doing um, something because in some of their their lists that they already have, they're Canadian books that are geared to an American audience so they can learn more about Canada. So they've got that newsletter. And they've got Novelist Notes. And this is really about um, more about how to use Novelist. And I haven't mentioned it so far, but Novelist has, uh, like EBSCO does, has masses and masses of, of um, support material. In the first screen, um, the, really the second screen for this um, session, uh, there was a very brightly colored striped image with, with students and books and, and Novelist, K-8 plus and Novelist plus. And that's actually um, just a screenshot that I took from what they call a computer topper. It's a little three-sided triangular, um, an image that you can print out and then fold in a sort of triangular shape to put on top of your computer screens. They have um, uh, they have um, web, little webcasts, short little webcasts. They have um, they have longer um, kind of how-tos for different things. They have extensive printed material. Um, as I mentioned before, I would print off some of it, like the appeal terms, which aren't easy to grasp in a first look at them or even a second list look, although they are there in the link. But I think it's easier just to introduce those to your students at some point and talk about how that works. Um, they're also out at all the conferences themselves, ALA and at least the American conferences. And there, um, in this one, Our Books Your Brand, they make available a, a webcast information from that conference that they brought back on libraries that are thinking about how to maintain the focus on reading with so much emphasis on technology. So there's, there's more here than anybody could ever use. You can also set up training with them. Um, one thing that I think they're missing, and I actually have put in a request about it, um, just a brief request, but I'm going to put a more detailed one, is I think that students are 
able to use this, even though the initial focus was for um, for librarians and, and then teachers and parents. I think this is a great thing for students to use. So I would like to see more HubSco um, little webcasts that are geared to students or maybe even students explaining to students because I think that's missing in all the EBSCO products and certainly we could do that ourselves, do little webcasts for that in our own libraries. But if um, but if they were able to produce something that was actually for a student audience in terms of the support that you could post on your website next to where students link to EBSCO. And of course, you can access this from uh, from home, just as you can any EBSCO product. So um, all of these from your website, just with a remote username and password. Um, there's another um, one here, another newsletter, which has lots of great stuff. Um, I wish I could scroll down in this one, um, but this is the, um, this one is, I guess there's one for February as well, maybe March for this reading advisory news. And this is, once again, Duncan Smith the librarian who came up with this whole concept. But there are a number of really interesting um, sort of guest people that are writing uh, contributions to this. So in, in either this one or one of the other ones for this RA News, I actually came across something that I'm going to send to people in my district because it was about e-readers, um, a little link to a study that's been done um, by the Frontier Foundation in Electronic Frontier Foundation in the States to see which e-readers are keeping track of the reading choices that you make. And some are and some aren't. And it's a very interesting thing to read as we move into e-books. Lindsay, a question for you. Yep. How can I sign up for the newsletter? Remember, they can't hear me. Do they ever repeat the question? Oh. How can I sign up for the newsletter and get it? Oh my goodness, I, sorry, I just realized my microphone was had sort of slipped there. Um, so the question that Arlene just passed to me was, how can I sign up for the newsletter? And um, the, the newsletter is available from, there's a number of ways to get to it, but um, one is just to go to, just type in um, novelist, EBSCO novelist in a search engine in Google. and. Um, and it'll bring to you, bring you to a site that has uh, all of this stuff, frequently asked questions. It has the newsletter bar there. You can see the archives. Um, it's all easily available there. I spent actually quite a bit of time looking um, at the people that were working for this organization. And when I said in the beginning that I really, I really love the idea that a, a librarian, a longtime librarian who's just passionate about reading is the person behind this idea. I also love the fact that you look on the website at the reader advisors that they have, and they are people that are, um, you'd be very happy to have putting together your book talks and anything else for you because they're all so experienced in reader's advisory. Um, Arlene, I can also uh, maybe send some of those links in an email since this wasn't live in the sense that I couldn't go and point to places where links could be found. That's good. I'll, I'll certainly on. Okay, that's great. Um, So as I mentioned before, I think it is really important to link your school library and novelist and link your public library and novelist. So right down below on this screen is the Czech Central Middle Schools catalog and the Czech GVPLs catalog. And my Greater Victoria Public Library, I realize they've gone to Biblio Commons, which is that kind of social media overlay. And the linking was a bit, um, it was linking to the old version of their catalog rather than the new. So I sent off a request this morning, and within an hour it had been done. So that's the kind of service um, the kind of service response which I have been getting from them, which is great. Um, the other thing here, in addition to the persistent link that I've already mentioned, which is the one just above the check the catalogs, um, you can also do, if anybody was in Gordon's session um, a couple of weeks ago, he mentioned that you can also do a feed. So if you use um, readers like Google Reader or um, any reader like that, you can set up the RSS feeds. So in, in most of um, 
in many of the records, in certain spots in the records, you'll see a link that gives you a choice of sending in, setting up an email alert. And then if you go to the help, you can help menu. Um, you can also find a section on how to set up um, an RSS feed. So if you're interested in everything that um, a particular author is bringing out, although that would be rather a slow, sort of a long-term wait, but if you're interested in a genre and you've got students that, uh, you know, love zombies or love mysteries or love gross books, whatever it is that they love, you can set up, you can set up a feed which will keep you alerted on what's new to novelist. So here's the accounts page. Um, what, it, what you see when you've actually created an account. And you can see that you've got your links to your persistent links and searches. And you've got your folders there, um, book lists and articles. Uh, books I want to read, books I have read, and of course, as I mentioned below on that slide, definitely a custom folder for book suggestions for the library. Uh, because then students have also, they've not only checked your catalog to make sure you don't already have it, but they've looked to see if they would really like it. They've been able to check um, check the little summary in there. And sometimes with nonfiction books, there's a table of contents just below the image of the book cover. And sometimes with fiction books, you can read the first chapter. I haven't found a good way to know how to access those books. Maybe that's another suggestion that I'll make to EBSCO. So I think that, for me, the thing that um, started me with uh, Loving Novelist was just, it was great to have in one spot all of this information about books and ability to link from one to the other. And every single one had an annotation, and it had subject headings, and um, it had a book cover. And, and then it became something that I used for um, ordering books and for just checking my collection to see what I had. But then I started to think last year that I really wanted to go to a more kind of a, um, a community-based selection. And I wanted to involve um, I wanted to involve people, students in particular, and teachers, in helping to choose what was in the collection. So I still read the reviews, and you know the final decision would still be mine. But they would be the ones making the suggestion. And my first way of doing this, doing that, was to have meetings at lunch where students came in and we talked about it. And then I thought, why are we not? all on Novelist. So I immediately switched over to that. And I had students on Novelist checking the collection running to me. So it's been a pretty informal basis this year. But I can see it expanding next year. Um, and I think it's a great way to make your library to do two things. One, to have students become more aware of all the great stuff that you have in your library that you have selected, but also a way to have it a two-way process where what they select, what they would like to suggest, also has an impact on what's in the library. I should mention a couple of other things. Um, Lexiles, I don't know if anybody could see in the record, but um, or if you're familiar with Lexiles, but Lexiles are what the reading levels are called in here uh, within Novelist. And the place that those reading levels come from is a company called Metametrics in the States. And they do an analysis of books of the, of the kind of the reading difficulty. And they, there's a whole, a whole, there's a lot of details that go into doing it. And they include those Lexiles in a book. So you'll see a link in every book, and it says um, it has a number in it. And you can check the Lexiles. The way that I've found most useful to use that is just if you have struggling readers um, and they say, I love this book, then go and look up that book and see what that Lexile is. And then you can, in the advanced search, you can you can then add that in as um, one of your uh, your search elements so that you know that you're going to return books that are not only um, gross and funny, but also, or whatever the, whatever the interest is, but they're also ones that are going to be within the range of what that student has already been able to, to um, successfully read. Um, so we're almost finished. Um, are there any questions that anyone has? I will, uh, just as the last thing I say, put together some things in a, 
an email that I'll send to, um, to Arlene and she can send out just some of those links that I couldn't show you. But if anybody has any questions or any comments or um, how many people think they might be interested in using Novelist in their library, if you could maybe with a happy face just show that that would appeal to you, you think you could see it with your students. Oh, great. I think it is um, something that you can, it's easy to start using. Everything links to another read-alike, um, whether it's the author title or series. So it's really easy to use right away, but it's also um, well worth going in and digging a little bit to find out what else you can do with it, because it's, um, it's got lots of, lots of extras that aren't evident at first. Oh, well, thank you very much. I see a thank you from Julie. Thanks. I very much appreciate everybody coming. And I'm, as I say, sorry that I, I uh, have such a bad voice today. But, um, but I'm a fan of this. And I really, I really hope that uh, we're using it all through BC, because I just think it's a great support for reading. <laughs>